Directions for the Government of the Passions Chapter 6 of Richard Baxter's Christian Directory, Part 1 Title 4 Directions Against Sinful Mirth and Pleasure Mirth is sinful, first, when men rejoice in that which is evil, as in the hurt of others, or in men's sin, or in the sufferings of God's servants, or the afflictions of the church, or the success or prosperity of the enemies of Christ, or of any evil cause. This is one of the greatest sins in the world, and one of the greatest signs of wickedness, when wickedness is it that they rejoice in. Second, when it is unseasonable, or in an unmeet subject, as to be merry in the time and place of mourning, to feast when one should fast, or for an unsanctified, miserable soul to be taken up in mirth, that is in the power of sin and Satan, and near to hell. Third, mirth is sinful when it tendeth to the committing of sin, or is managed by sin, as to make merry with lies and fables and tempting, unnecessary, time-wasting dances, plays, or recreations, or with the slander or abuse of others, or with drunkenness, gluttony, or excess. Fourth, mirth is sinful when it is an hindrance to our duty, and unfitteth a soul for the exercise of that grace which is most suitable to its estate and when it hindereth a sinner's conviction and humiliation, and resisteth the Spirit of God, and balleth down the calls of grace and the voice of conscience that they cannot be heard, and when it banisheth all sober consideration about the matters that we should most regard, and will not give men leave to think with fixedness and sobriety upon God and upon themselves, their sin and danger, upon death and judgment and the life to come, when it makes the soul more unfit to take reproof, to profit by a sermon, to call upon God. This drunken mirth, which shuts out reason and silenceth conscience, and laughs at God and jesteth at damnation, and doth but intoxicate the brain and make men mad in the matters where they should most show their wisdom, I say this mirth is the devil's sport, and the sinner's misery, and the wise man's pity, of which Solomon speaketh. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of mirth, what doth it? As a madman who casteth firebrands, arrows, and death, so is the man that deceiveth his neighbor, and saith, Am I not in sport? It is a sport to a fool to do mischief. Fifth, but mirth is most horridly odious when it is blasphemous and profane, when incarnate devils do make themselves merry with jesting and mocking at scripture, or at the judgments of God, or the duties of religion, or in horrid oaths and cursed speeches against the servants of the Lord. Direction 1. First see that thou be a person fit for mirth, and that thou be not a miserable slave of Satan in an unregenerate, unholy, unjustified state. Thou wouldest scarce think the innocent games or sports were becoming a malefactor that must die tomorrow. An unregenerate, unholy person is sure whenever he dieth to be damned. If he believe not this, he must deny God or the gospel to be true. And he is not sure to live an hour, and he is sure that he shall die ere long. And now, if you have not fooled away your reason, tell me whether your reason can justify the mirth of such a man. Dost thou ask what harm is it to be merry? None at all for one that hath cause to be merry, and rejoiceth in the Lord. But for a man to be merry in the way to hell, and that so near it, for a man to be merry before his soul be sanctified, and his sin be pardoned, or before he seeketh it with all his heart, this is harm. If folly and unbelief and contempt of God and his dreadful justice be any harm, 
Oh, hearken to the calls of God, abhor thy sins, and set thy heart on heaven and holiness, and then God in conscience will allow thee to be merry. Get a renewed heart and life, and get the pardon of thy sins, and a title to heaven, and a readiness to die and then there is reason and wisdom in thy mirth. Then thy mirth will be honorable and warrantable, better than the lame man's that was healed that went with Peter and John into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. But it is a most pitiful sight to see any ungodly, unregenerate sinner to laugh and sport and play and live merrily, as if he knew not what evil is near him. It would draw tears from the eyes of a believer that knoweth him, and thinketh where he is like to dwell for ever. I remember the credible narrative of one that lived not far from me, that in his profaneness was wont to wish that he might see the devil, who at last appeared to him in his terror. And sometimes he smiled on him, and the man was wont to say, that he never seemed so ugly and terrible as when he smiled, and the man was affrighted by it into a reformed life. So, though a servant of the devil be never comely, yet he never seemeth so ghastly as when he is most merry in his misery. Direction 2 Yet do not destroy nature by overmuch heaviness under pretense that thou hast no right to be merry. For, first, the very discovery of thy misery puts thee into the fairer hopes of mercy. Second, and many of God's children live long without assurance of their justification, and yet should not therefore cast away all joy. Third, and so much ease and quiet of mind must be kept up by the unsanctified themselves, as is necessary to preserve their natures, that they may have time continued and may wait on God until they obtain grace. Above all men, they have reason to value their lives, lest they die and be lost, before they be recovered. And therefore, as they must not famish themselves by forbearing meat or drink, so their sorrows must not be such as may destroy their bodies, of which more anon. Direction 3. See that you first settle the peace of your souls upon solid grounds, and get such evidences of your special interest in Christ and heaven as will rationally warrant you to rejoice, and then make it the business of your lives to rejoice and delight yourselves in God, and take this as the principal part of grace and godliness, and not as a small or indifferent thing, and so let all lawful, natural mirth be taken in as animated and sanctified by this holy delight and joy. And know that this natural, sanctified mirth is not only lawful, but a duty exceeding congruous and comely for a thankful believer in his way to everlasting joy. This is the true method of rejoicing. Though, as I said, so much quietness may be kept up by the unregenerate as is needful to keep up life and health, and the gospel where it cometh is tidings of great joy to those that hear it, yet no man can live a truly comfortable, merry life but in this method. But all his mirth beside that which either supporteth nature or meeteth mercy in his returning to God will be justly chargeable with madness, and maketh him a more pitiful sight. The first thing, therefore, to be done is to lay the groundwork of true mirth, and this is done by unfeigned repenting and turning to God by faith in Christ, and becoming new creatures, a sanctified, peculiar people, and being justified and adopted to be the children of God, and then by discerning, upon sober trial, the evidences and witness of all this in ourselves, that we may know that we have passed from death to life. And though there are several degrees, both of grace and of the discerning of it, some having but little holiness, and some but little discerning of it in themselves, yet the least may afford much comfort to the soul upon justifiable grounds, though not so much as the greater degrees of grace and clearer discerning of it may do. 
The foundation being thus laid, it must be our next endeavor to build upon it a settled peace of conscience and quietness of soul. For till we can attain to joy, it is a great mercy to have peace, and to be free from the accusations, fears, and griefs which belong to the unjustified. And peace must be the temper more ordinary than much joy to be expected in this our frail condition. Thirdly, peace being thus settled, we must endeavor to rise up daily into joy, as our great duty and our great felicity on earth. It being frequently and earnestly commanded in the Scriptures that we rejoice in the Lord always, and shout for joy all that are upright in heart. Thus he that proveth his own work may have rejoicing in himself, even in the testimony of his conscience, of his own simplicity and godly sincerity. And this all believers should maintain and actuate in themselves. Fourthly, with this rejoicing in God, our lawful, natural mirth must be taken in as subordinate or sanctified. That is, we must further our holy joy by natural mirth and cheerfulness, and by the comforts of our bodies and God's lower mercies, promote the service and the comfort of our souls. And this is the right place for this mirth to come in, and this is the true method of rejoicing. Direction 4 Mark well the usefulness and tendency of all thy mirth, and if it be useful to fit thee for thy duty, and intended by thee to that end, though you always observe not that intention at the time, and if it tend to do thee good, or help thee to do good, without a greater hurt or danger, then cherish and promote it. But if it tend to carry thee away from God, to any creature, and to unfit thy soul for the duties of thy place, and to carry thee into sin, then avoid it as thy hurt still remembering that the necessary support of nature must not be avoided by good or bad. A Christian that hath any acquaintance with himself and with the work of holy watchfulness may discern what his mirth is by the tendency and effects, and know whether it doth him good or harm. Direction 5 Take heed that the flesh defile not your mirth by dropping in any obscene or ribald talk, or by stirring up fleshly lust and sin, which it will quickly do if not well watched, and holy mirth and cheerfulness is very apt to degenerate on a sudden into sinful mirth. Direction 6. Consider what your mirth is like to prove to others as well as to yourselves. If it be like to stir up sin in others, or to be offensive to them, you must the more avoid it in their presence, or manage it with a greater caution. If it be needful to cheer up the drooping minds of those you converse with, or to remove their prejudice against a holy life, you must the more give place to it, for it is good or bad as it tendeth unto good or bad. Direction 7 Never leave out reason or godliness from any of your mirth. Abhor that mirth that maketh a man a fool, or playeth a fool, and take heed of that ungodliness which maketh a man merriest when he is furthest from God, like the horse or ox that leapeth and playeth for gladness when he is unyoked or loosed from his labor. Something of God in heaven should appear to be dropped into all our mirth to sweeten and to sanctify it. Direction 8 Watch your tongues in all your mirth, for they are very apt to take liberty then to sin. Mirth is to the tongue as holidays and playdays to idle scholars, who are glad of them as a time in which they think they have liberty to game and fight and do amiss. Direction 9 if a word break forth from yourselves or companions to the wrong of others in your mirth, as of backbiting, evil speaking, jeering, scorning, defaming, yea, though it be your enemy, rebuke it and cast it out as dirt or dung that falleth into your dish or cup. Direction 10 
If profaneness intrude, and any make merry with jesting at scripture, religion, or the slanders, or scorns of godly persons with a tendency to make religion odious or contemptible, if they are such as you may speak to, reprove them with reverent seriousness to their terror. If they are not, then show your abhorrence of it by turning your backs and quitting the place and company of such devilish enemies of God. Be not silent or seemingly consenting witnesses of such odious mirth against your Maker. Direction 11 if the mirth of others in your company grow insipid, frothy, foolish, wanton, impious, or otherwise corrupt, drop in some holy salt to season it, and something that is serious and divine to awe it and repress it. As to remember them of God's presence, or to recite such a text as Ephesians 5, 3, and 4, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named amongst you, as becometh saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Direction 12 If mirth grow immoderate and exceed in measure, and carry you away from God and duty by the very carnal pleasure of it, have always at hand these following considerations to repress it. First, remember that God is present, and levity is not comely in his sight. Second, remember that death and judgment are at hand, when all this levity will be turned into seriousness. Third, remember that your souls are yet under a great deal of sin and wants and danger, and you have a great deal of serious work to do. Fourth, look on Jesus Christ and remember what an example he gave you upon earth, whether he laughed and played and jested and taught you immoderate or carnal mirth, and whether you live like the disciples of a crucified Christ. Fifth, think on the ordinary way to heaven, described in Scripture, which is through many tribulations, afflictions, fastings, temptations, humiliations, sufferings and mortifications, and think whether a wanton, jesting, playful life be like to this. Sixth, think of the course of the ancient and excellent Christians who went to heaven through labor and watchings and fasting and poverty and cruel persecutions and not through carnal mirth and sport. Seventh, think of the many calamitous objects of sorrow that are now abroad in the world of the millions of heathens and Mahometans, and other strangers and enemies to Christ, of the obstinate Jews, of the papal tyranny and usurpation, and of the divided state of all the churches, and the profaneness and persecution, and uncharitableness and contentions, and mutual reproaches and revilings which make havoc for the devil among the members of Christ. This audio recording was read by Michael Ives. I hope you found it enlightening and edifying. Visit westportexperiment.com for more audio resources, and where I write about parish missions, the care of souls, and all things reformed.